Chapter 17, Section 2 and 3 is what we are discussing today. You may want to have your book to follow along. You know, that's always a good thing to be paying attention to what's going on. It kind of helps you stay focused when it's a Sunday and you're maybe thinking you'd rather be sleeping or something. Capacitors. Have you ever had those um, disposable cameras, little cardboard cameras? Sometimes they set them at, they used to always do this, set them at tables at weddings and then people would take pictures and you'd leave them and then the bride and groom would get develop that film and that's, now we've all got digital and everybody just has their little hashtag and everybody does that. But anyway, I don't know if you've ever used one of those little cameras, but they often will have a flash to them and you have a little button that you push and you'll hear a little squealing thing going and then the light comes on and it's ready to take a picture it's that little squealing thing that I want to talk about some of you have no idea what I'm talking about <laughs> but that's okay my illustrations they get old when technology moves on same as the yellow disposable cameras those, yeah those little yellow disposable cameras they're yellow if they're Kodak they might be green if they're Fuji and then you have to manually advance the yeah all right or a flash a flash for a modern camera, not a flash that is built into the camera, but a separate flash will have a button on the back, and when you turn it on, you often will hear that same squealing sound, but really faint. And then finally a little light will come on. I'm going to talk about the little squealing fan and then why the little light comes on. It's a capacitor. You are charging a capacitor. So you're connecting it when you push the little button or turn on the flash, you're connecting it to the battery, and it begins to charge up a device that we are going to be talking about called a capacitor. And when that capacitor is charged up, it has the ability to very quickly release that charge. And that charge can be, depending on the type of the capacitor, at um, more energy. In fact, that's almost always the case. More energy than the battery itself could release if you just hooked it to the battery. So you charge the capacitor, so you have a high potential energy, high capacitance we'll be talking about, and then you click the shutter, and the flash goes off, and boom, a whole bunch of energy goes into that flash, and you get a bright light, and you take a picture, and everything is nice and properly exposed. A capacitor. You maybe have heard of these things called, oh, my, my mind went blank, you know, the, the police use tasers. <laughs> there it came back. You may have heard of these things called tasers. Tasers have capacitors in them so that they hold a high energy charge ready to be released when they make contact with the criminal, not you, with the criminal. Capacitor is a device that is used to store electrical potential energy. And capacitance is the ability of a conductor to store energy in the form of electrically separated charges. The simplest capacitor is called a parallel plate capacitor, where you literally have two parallel metal plates next to each other. And you hook one of them up to the negative side of a battery, and the other one up to the positive side of a battery, and charges flow until you get one capacitor plate positively charged, and the other negatively charged, and then you can disconnect it over here. I should have drawn in a switch. We'll get to these symbols at a later point. Then we open the switch, and you have a charge capacitor ready to fire off all that energy. So our first, oh, and that is measured in farads. A farad, capital S, is a coulomb per volt. So it's how many coulomb charges per volt. Now, there have been quite a few of these little formulas as we go along in this chapter. I have some more good news for you. I am going to, on the test day, actually give you quite a few formulas. They will not have these words with them. They will simply be the formula. So these three chapters have lots of lots. So I'm going to give you some formulas, and you will have to know what they stand for and how to use them, but that will reduce your stress a little bit, hopefully. All right. So farads are how we measure it, coulombs per volt. So the capacitance ratio of charge potential over charge to potential difference or voltage. So there is just in coulombs per volt, there's the formula for figuring out the capacitance of something. There's my nice little video that I had all preloaded. Here we go. 
Here is their picture of the parallel plate capacitor, which literally is two parallel conducting plates. Each of the metal plates is connected to one terminal of a battery. When the circuit is closed, charges are removed from one plate and accumulate on the other, leaving each plate with a small net charge. The transfer of charge stops when the potential difference between the plates is equal to the potential difference between the terminals of the battery. When the switch is opened, the potential difference between the plates remains. Because the separated charges on the plates have gained energy, the two plates have stored electrical energy. So a capacitor is a way to store electrical energy. So the battery is going to charge it, and then all it can charge it to is whatever potential difference the battery has. If it's 9 volts, then we can get it to 9 volts. And then you disconnect the battery, and that capacitor then just sits there with a charge on it. So it's not a battery because it can't continually manufacture potential difference. These batteries do it with a chemical reaction. So all it is is storing it, and it's a one-time thing. It fires off, and it's done. Then you'd have to charge it again if you were going to use that energy again. Capacitance is going to depend on the size and shape of the capacitor. For a parallel plate capacitor, and here comes another formula, the capacitance is the permeability of the vacuum. Permeability. Here's the idea. When I have two plates, opposite charges. If I charge them too high of a potential difference, a spark would jump across. It would discharge. Well, the spark will jump across when it reaches its uh, the permeability level. In other words, you can permeate. The electrical charge can permeate through, in this case, a vacuum. So a parallel plate capacitor in a vacuum has nothing between it. So there's nothing to stop that charge. So a vacuum has its own permeability value or number to it or constant. So we can put other materials in between that vacuum, and we'll be talking in between the plates instead of a vacuum, and they will have their different permeability values, which means you can hold more of a charge separated without it discharging. It's like having an insulator in between there, essentially. Area of the plate divided by the distance between them. So permeability of the vacuum happens to be this number right down there. You don't need to memorize it. You'd be able to look it up. So we put in between them what's called a dielectric so that our parallel plate capacitor or any capacitor has a dielectric between the conducting parts that are being charged so that it doesn't discharge or jump a spark across it and discharge. So the material between the capacitor's plates is called a dielectric. It reduces the strength of the electric field. If I did not have this dielectric here, all these positives on the bottom and the negatives on the top, it would be a very strong electric field going up. How do we know the direction of the arrows or the direction of an electric field? It's the direction a positive charge would move. You want to, yeah, you want to drill that into your brain because it's going to come into play on a lot of things here. So when I put a dielectric in between, it is in the presence of this electric field. Now this dielectric has positive and negative charges in it because it's made up of atoms. So the positives will be pushed away from or in the direction of the electric field and the negatives will go opposite of the electric field. So now concentrate for a minute in these little areas. Well, when I have these positives moving in the direction of the electric field, they are moving closer to the negatives and they are reducing the strength of that electric field. They're balancing it out. Same thing happens here. These negatives are moving opposite the electric field towards the positives and they will reduce the strength of the electric field. So if I have reduced the strength of the electric field between these two parallel plates, then it will not discharge as easily and I can put a higher charge on it without it discharging. That's the purpose of a dielectric. Your keyboard often has capacitors in it to make it work. 
So if we have a key, and down here we have a little capacitor, and it is movable, so you can squish it together, if you will. When you put them together by pressing the key, then it reduces the distance and a charge will fire across it because you have gotten them closer to each other and so the charge can reach the other side. So that is how many keyboards sense when you have pressed a key. There's just a little capacitor down there and it's reduced the distance and the charge goes across. So it's not a switch turning on and off, but it's something that works essentially like a switch. So a certain distance where charges can't get through and they just basically figured that out? Correct. That would be manufactured so that the charge that they put on that capacitor from your keyboard from being plugged in or the battery that's running it, the charge that is on that capacitor will not discharge at the unpressed distance. But when you press it, it will discharge. And they just figured it out exactly right. Yeah. So what's the difference between that and a mechanical keyboard? Do you, do you know anything about mechanical keyboards? Um, it's actually, that's well, right. when you say mechanical keyboard, I think of a typewriter. Okay. Mechanical, and those are, there's mechanical linkage, yeah. where there's actually levers that go between your your keys that you press, and for a typewriter, the thing that then strikes. Yeah. That's what I think of. I mean, that's what mechanical usually means, is there's actually mechanical linkages, connections. Yeah. So, that must be so this is an electronic one. Yeah. The simplest capacitor consists of two parallel metal plates that are close together, as shown here. The capacitor is shown discharged, with no net negative or positive charge on either plate. Connecting the capacitor to a battery causes the plate to become charged, with an excess of electrons on the negative plate, and an equal excess of positively charged ions on the positive plate. Here, the plates are separated by an air gap, but most capacitors use a dielectric material or a vacuum between the plates. Regardless of which insulator separates the plates, the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is directly proportional to the area of one of the plates and inversely proportional to the separation of the plates. The permittivity of the medium is a proportionality constant, as shown here for the case of a vacuum separating the plates. So if I'm directly proportional to area, that simply tells me the bigger the area, the more charge. Makes sense. Inversely proportional to the distance, the shorter the distance, the less charge I can hold because it will want to discharge as I get it closer together. Hopefully that makes sense. Potential energy stored in a charge capacitor depends on how much charge is stored and what the voltage or the potential difference is on those things. So here's another potential energy formula. Like I mentioned, there's a lot of them. Let's look at a problem and see if we can do this problem. 593, number two. Have your calculators ready to help me out here. Parallel plate capacitor has a charge of six microcoulombs. So if I have a charge, looks like they're using capital P here, microcoulombs, that's 6.0 times 10 to the negative, negative six coulombs. Always love having our basic SI unit and charged by a potential difference of 1.25 volts. So the potential difference is 1.25 volts. And that doesn't look like a V. This looks like a V. Find its capacitance. All it is. Whoops, that's not all it is. You tell me the capacitance. You'll have to look up at the book. Or maybe you remember. Yeah, there you go. So, charge per volt. Six times ten to the negative six, and we were doing 1.25. What's the answer? What's the capacitance of this thing? times 10 to the negative 6 what? What do we mer what do we <laughs> 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 
It is coulombs per volt. We have a name for it. What do we measure capacity? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, fly, fly, fly. Fairheads. Yeah. Uh, Fairheads. Yeah. So you could call this 4.8 microfarads. Absolutely right. I'll write that down here as well. 4.8 microfarads. And they want to know, part B, what is or how much electric potential energy is stored when the capacitor is connected to a 1.5 volt battery. So there was part A. And part B, we change it to a 1.5 volt battery. And we say, what is the form of electric potential? So we're using this. <laughs> one half Q delta V. It's this one. It's not the capacitance anymore. So one half, our charge is still 6 times 10 to the negative 6. And now we have 1.5 volts. Got 4.5 times 10 to the negative 6 or 4.5? Yep. What unit? Microvolts. Oh, that's Joules. Energy. Joules. Energy is measured in joules, or you could say 4.5 microjoules of energy if you want to. All right. These are not hard formulas. It's just the fact that we have a lot of them. Current. So now we are finally getting to what do we call when we move charges, not just when we're discharging a jumping electric spark there from static charges. Electric current, rate at which electric charges pass through a given area. You do need to, this is not what I'm going to give you. You do need to know this one, and there'll be some others. I'll talk about it before we have the test. I is going to be the letter we use for current, and it's charge per unit time. So we measure charges in what? Um, well, uh, sorry, per coulombs. Coulombs. Per, we measure time in seconds. So one coulomb per second is called an ampere. Often we call them amps, but ampere is the name for it. We'll, we'll often just say amps. So a current or a charge per unit time, coulombs per second, is one amp or one ampere. Now. Conventional current, I'll show you a video here in just a second. Conventional current, we are saying what direction is it? Let me ask you the question, what direction do we know an electric field is? How do we know the direction of an electric field? Positive charge or direction, positive charge. Somewhere. Direction a positive charge would go. So remember that for what is called conventional current. We always draw current showing the direction that a positive charge would go. So let's say I happen to have this copper wire. This copper wire actually takes electrons, and the electrons are flowing. Which direction? Keep this eye with it, one picture, one diagram. Which direction are those electrons flowing? To the left. How do we know they're going to the left? Because the positives are going to the right. Because if the positives are going to the right, which is the direction we call conventional current, the direction the positives are going, the negatives will be going in the opposite direction. So in a wire, the charge carriers are almost always electrons. So my electrons may be heading to the left, but when I do my physics on it, I draw the current to the right. We always draw the current. It's called conventional current. The direction a positive goes. I don't care what actually is moving. We draw the direction that a positive does. It keeps us consistent. Everybody's on the same page. At least everybody who has taken physics is on the same page, and that's us. So let's see our next visual concept. Electric current is the net flow of electric charge carriers from one point to another. The charge carriers can be negative, positive, or a combination of the two, which is the case is not a concern for most applications. 
For this reason, scientists have chosen to treat most electric currents as if they were entirely due to the movement of positive charges. This equivalent current is referred to as conventional current. For many applications, it is not important whether the negative charge carriers are moving in one direction or the positive charge carriers are moving in the opposite direction. In these cases, scientists treat electric current as if it were entirely due to the movement of positive charges. The conventional current is a current that has the same net movement of positive charge as the actual current. In the case of a current within a metal, the actual current is due entirely to the movement of negatively charged electrons. If the electrons, which are negatively charged, move from right to left, the conventional current is an equal amount of positive charge moving from left to right. In particle accelerators, currents can consist entirely of moving protons. In this case, the conventional current is the same as the actual current. In some gases and dissolved salts, current can be due to positive charges moving to the right and negative charges moving in the opposite direction. In this case, the conventional current would consist of positive charges of an amount equal to the total movement of charge, but all moving to the right. I think there's a chart like this in your book, but they have arrows, and they should have done the arrows in this one. There you go. Turn to page 596. There's the better picture right there. They needed to have arrows on their blood little illustration that is going on. So the bottom row, conventional current, is what we care about. The top row is what actually is moving, but we don't care, in most cases, what actually is moving. We just care about the direction that that current is going. Um, that third case down there, they talked about when we have positives going in one way and negatives going in the other way, it often happens in solutions with dissolved salts. What's Gatorade? Sugar water. <laughs> it's sugar water, You're exactly right, and salt. There's a lot of salts in it. Not all just sodium chloride salt, but there's a lot of salts in it. You've heard of electrolyte drinks? Gatorade's an electrolyte drink. You know what an electrolyte is? It's a liquid that carries charge, is what an electrolyte is. Now, what it does in your body, well, you take another class for what it does in your body. But for here, we don't care about that. That's right. <laughs> um, but electrolyte carries a charge. So, Gatorade, is it good? Almost always water is great. Now, it is true, if you have sweat too much, you do need to replace electrolytes. But almost always water is just fine for what you need. Water. Unless you happen to be the manufacturer of Gatorade, and then you advertise that everybody thinks you have to drink it. Yes, sir? Water has electrolytes. No, not usually. Water doesn't. Is that what you put electrolytes in water? I am sure there is, because that's what they've done at Gatorade. Yep. But then they add a bunch of sugar because they want it to taste good. Oh, so and for people to, to okay. keep drinking it and buying it from them. Now, drift velocity. If I walk over here, and even though these are fluorescent, since they've been warmed up a little bit, okay, I'm going to count down three, two, one, and then I'm going to flip the switch, and I want you to time how long it takes for those lights to come on. You ready? Three, two, one. Uh, yeah, they flicker a little bit. <laughs> How fast does it happen? Uh, essentially instantly, right? So we have a current. This is my switch over here on the wall. And we have a current that has to get information from this switch up to those lights for them to come on. It's probably a few meters to get there, right? Now, in the wire, electrons are the things that are doing the moving. That signal gets there almost instantly, but the electrons are not moving from that switch up to the light instantly. So how does it come on without the electrons leaving that switch and making it all the way to the light? Any ideas? Isn't it like the charge? Like it's whenever you you're, you're using the energy that you store the capacity. Yeah, that's not what you're saying. Okay. Drift the velocity. <laughs> I actually have, have, we have not talked about the reason why. Here's my switch, but I was just saying if somebody could maybe figure it out. 
Here's the light down here. What what is actually the current carrying particles in the wire? Electrons. electrons. They're electrons. An electron does not have to leave here and then arrive over here for that light to go on. What is in that wire all throughout that wire? <laughs> for us, electrons. That wire is full of electrons. All, what travels essentially at the speed of light is the electrical field. Uh -oh. And I just got through drawing that in the wrong direction after lecturing you on drawing those things the right direction. The electrical field travels that fast, which means if I have an electrical field pointing to the left in my diagram, those electrons want to go to the right. And all of them will essentially instantly move. So all it needs is for the one electron that is right beside that light to move, and then there it is. It's got the energy from that electron, because the electrical field that provides the energy, the push on it, is the thing that's going on. So it's technically just pushing all of them into each other and then moves the last one? Well, it's a field. Remember, this is an electrical, it's a field force. So all the electrons by themselves, I don't have to have another electron run into me. I just feel the field force, and I move. Oh, okay. Because the electric field moves at the speed of light. So it's almost like, I, like air pressure. You would feel it everywhere at the same time if somehow all the I don't know. Well, again, that's the funny part about trying to explain it. It's a little hard. It's just like magnets. I mean, you know, the force of magnets, you feel a force. Um, it's just like that, except it's electrical force, but it's just like that. If you were an electron and you were in the presence of electrical field, you would feel a push or a pull just like if you were hanging onto a magnet. Drift velocity is literally the speed or the velocity that the electrons move. And it is very slow. It averages about, like it says in the book here, um, a meter in a minute. You might have to read through the book to get that. 2.46 times 10 to the negative 4 meters per second. All right. So that's like... That's what it really is. So, yeah, so I multiplied it by 60 and we'll get, I think it's about a meter per minute. I have to do the math again. So that's pretty slow. So if this is five meters from the switch over to there, no, it's about a meter per hour, not a minute. It's about a meter per hour. It would take about five hours for an electron actually to make it from where that switch is to where the light bulb over there is. Why? Why is when this electron tries to move, notice there's an electric field down here, so that electron's wanting to move to the right, its drift velocity is going to be to the right. It is not in a hollow pipe. It is in a solid piece of metal. And that electron runs into something and bounces off, and runs into something else and bounces off, and does that, goes all over the place. It has a net velocity to the right, but it has forward and backwards and sideways, so there's a lot of traffic in there, which also gives rise to the next thing we're going to get to, resistance. What causes the resistance in a wire? All the other things that that electron bumps into, the atoms that are in that wire. It's not just a free open tube that those electrons can run through. They're part of a solid. So drift velocity is the net velocity of a charge carrier moving in an electric field. Drift speeds are relatively small because of the many collisions that occur when an electron moves through a conductor. So we'll do have a little video on the drift velocity here. Hopefully they'll remember to put some arrows on this one to make it a little more... Factors that affect resistance. That's not what I want. Drift velocity. I think so. I must have, yeah, I must have clicked on the wrong thing. Here we go. When a conductor is in electrostatic equilibrium, its electrons move randomly, similar to the atoms or molecules of gas. But if a potential difference is applied across the conductor, a net electric field is created inside the conductor. <laughs> Due to this electric field, the electrons inside the conductor move. Okay. 
when you draw it, do However, little arrows. However, individual electrons there don't move go. in a straight line. Instead, they just collide with the electron. vibrating atoms of the conductor <laughs> and move in a zigzag pattern. The average displacement of an electron divided by the time required for the displacement is called drift velocity. The drift velocity is the net velocity of a charge carrier moving in an electric field. So that sounds like a good question, you know, for on a test. What's drift velocity? All right, moving on. Resistance. Oh, I thought we didn't have it till next time. So that is today. The opposition presented to electric current by a material or device. So it's literally the resistance to flow. The resistance. I will not be giving you this formula on the test either. Fairly simple one. Resistance is measured in ohms, O-H-M-S. So meditate upon that. Here's our symbol that we have. <laughs> oh, I thought it was good. All right. Potential difference divided by current. So potential difference is measured in what? Um, Volts. No. Current is measured in? Joules. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, uh, amps. Amps. Farads are capacitance. Yeah. Wait. So a volt per amp is an ohm. <laughs> ohm is resistance. Voltage is potential difference. Current measured in amps. Those are really the three things when we're talking about moving electricity. For many materials, resistance is constant over a wide, wide range of potential differences. That means this. If I hook up a one and a half volt battery to my wire, maybe my wire has a two ohm resistance to it. I hook up a nine volt battery to my wire. It still has a two ohm resistance to it. I hook up 120 volts to my wire. It has a two ohm resistance to it. So that is called an ohmic device or ohmic materials where the resistance is constant. But there are some materials where that resistance is not constant. It will vary with how much potential difference you put on it and those are called non-ohmic materials. So non-ohmic materials, you have heard of LEDs. What is an LED? stand for? Like an LED light. What does LED stand for? Anybody know? Aluminum. Light emitting diode. A diode is a non-ohmic device. A diode lets electricity through in one direction or current in one direction but not the other direction. So it has very low resistance when you hook up your potential difference one way and a very high resistance when you hook up your potential difference the other way. So a diode is one example of a non-ohmic device. Resistance, length affects resistance, cross-sectional area affects resistance, temperature affects resistance. Let's see if we can logically conclude how each of these would probably affect resistance. What do you think length will do to resistance? If I have a longer wire, what do you think that will do to the resistance? More resistance. Less. More resistance. Why more resistance? Because it's it's more strong. Yeah, think of what resistance is. We're bumping into stuff, the atoms that are in there. I have a whole bunch more stuff to bump into on a longer wire than I do on a shorter wire. So length of wire will affect resistance. Um, some of the things I kind of like to watch sometimes are solar power stuff, where people go out and they make themselves a house and then they, they live off the grid. If you have solar power, you want to have as short a wire as possible from your solar panel onto your batteries where you are going to store that power. Because of all the uh, voltage that you lose through resistance over long wires. It's really susceptible. Solar power is really susceptible because it's such a small amount of voltage that you're generating in those panels. How about cross-sectional area? What do you think happens? Bigger wire, bigger cross-sectional area. Tell me about resistance, do you think? That one is less, less resistance. Go ahead. It's like less stuff in between. This one, to me, is easiest to think of is if you think of water and a pipe. If you have a small pipe, it's harder for that water to go through. 
the bigger that pipe, the easier it is for that water to go through. So even if any one individual spot has the same resistance, well, you have so many more spots where the current can be moving through. So a bigger area is going to be lower resistance. Temperature. See if you can deduct from some other things we've learned. If I raise the temperature of my wire, what do you think that is going to do? Heat expands. Makes more connection. Yeah, more connected. So less, 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 I'm assuming. All right. How you started was perfect. Heat is higher kinetic energy. What does kinetic energy mean? What are we talking about? Particles moving. Particles moving. Okay, so I'm going to illustrate it this way. Right now, all of you have fairly low kinetic energy. You're just sitting there in the desk. I'm an electron that's moving through you guys. Now I'm doing it pretty easy. Now, I'm not going to have you do it, but if you stood up, we got rid of the desk, and you just started going back and forth like this, and then I tried to walk through it, what would happen? There you go. More resistance. More resistance is going to happen. I the electron would speed up. Right. Yeah, sure. Program. Exactly. But the other electrons would also But the other, all the other materials are also speeding up, and so you've got a mess like this that you're trying to be an electron going through. Please be. Tell all right. <laughs> so, cool off. Tom, just cool off. I'm trying to get through. So, uh, There's double meaning to that. All right, go ahead. When you have wires heat up or your balance heats up too much or something like that, and then it, like, it breaks over time. Okay, so here's what's going on. When you're heating up whatever your electrical component is, the wire, the ballast, whatever it is, then it is creating more resistance, which means there's more wear and tear on that. And also... When you heat it up, the resistant, when you have resistance, it provides heat. That energy of trying to get through, essentially friction, produces heat. And so when you have a hot wire, higher resistance, and then that higher resistance producing heat, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter until you start a fire. That's what can happen if too much current is trying to be pushed through the thing. All right, now we are ready for this one. The resistance of a length of wire depends on several factors. Its length, its cross-sectional area, the material it is made of, and the temperature of the wire. Long wires have more resistance than short wires. This is because the current must force its way through a longer path. Similarly, a wire will have more resistance if it is very narrow. The current must all push through a tight space in order to flow. Copper is among the very best conductors of electricity. Metals such as iron or aluminum are more difficult for current to flow in. Higher temperatures also cause high resistance. This is because the random vibrations of the metal atoms can disrupt the flow of current. Consequently, the very best wires to use for low resistance would be short, thick wires made of copper and kept at a low temperature. So there's one more, there it is, that I forgot to talk about. Material, what it is made up of. So copper is a good conductor. What else is a good conductor? Gold's a good conductor, better than copper. Not so much rubber wires. <laughs> not so good. They bend real well, not going to conduct much electricity. So why don't we have copper, you see these overhead power lines, they're largely aluminum, steel, some too, probably steel. Strength for it. And it's expensive to make copper stuff. So. Yeah, and expense, exactly right. So anytime you are needing to get a lot of current over an a from one spot to another spot. Your ideal is, of those four things, you start telling me what is the ideal if you want to have the best current flow. You want a short. Short? Gold. Gold, sure. Big, massive pieces. Gold. Massive pieces. And then low temperature. And keep it cool. There you go. Because if you don't keep it cool, there you go. Well, those are the concepts. Those are the concepts. And if you think of those simple ideas like that, it answers a lot of questions. I'll have to tell you a little illustration. The beginning of the week, last... Sunday, I don't know when it was, I pulled my mower out for the first time this season to, to mow. And it just wasn't running well. And it's like, what is going on? And so uh, I first, I checked the fuel and the fuel filter, it all seemed to be fine, blew through it. You know, that's a technical way of measuring it. It seemed to be fairly open. Um, 
I had air getting in, and I thought, okay, and I need electricity for this thing to run. So let me pause there for just a minute. A long time ago, in Sabbath school class, um, Hammy Hostetter's grandfather was telling a story, and I was in Sabbath school class. I was a little kid, I don't know, juniors. I don't know what it was. You know, I was 10 years old. And he talked about engines. He says, engines really are fairly simple. They just need three things. You need fuel, and you need um, compression, air coming in and compressing it, and you need a spark. And then you've got an engine. I mean, there's more stuff that goes on to it, but those are the basic things. And I have carried that through me my whole life. And so I got this mower that's not working, so that's what I'm checking. Is my airflow good coming into that? Am I getting fuel into that thing? Now let's check the electricity. And so I decided, well, let me pull off the spark plug wire, and maybe I need to clean the spark plug a little bit, or the connector there a little bit, and it's got a corroded or something like that. So I pull it off, and the whole wire comes off of my hand. It's like, what in the world? So I removed the cover over my engine, and rodents had been in my shed. And they chewed through my spark plug wire, another little wire that was running around, just laying there, three pieces, totally chewed through. So, it's fairly simple what it takes to be a good current that's going on, and chewed up wire is not a good current that is flowing. So anyhow, uh, luckily I found a place online where I could order some parts, and, and so I was real excited. Friday, they came in, and so right after physics class, I went home and put my new stuff back together, and it ran great, so I'm happy now. All right. 595, number four. Now I need to get rid of those rodents. I didn't see my shock them or anything? <laughs> yeah, no, well, no, nothing was running. You know, nothing's running. So they're just happily chewing away at the insulation of the water. So I don't know why they like that, but they do. 595, number four. The compressor on an air conditioner draws 40 amps. So that is letter I. 40.0 amps of current. And it, where did we go here? When it starts up, if the startup time is 0.5 seconds, so that starter is going to have to be sending that current for 0 0.50 seconds. And that's a lot of current, by the way. That's a lot, a lot of current. How much charge passes a cross-sectional area of the circuit at this time? So you tell me an equation that is going to help us figure this out. I, I equals Q over T time. Dump. There you go. And their question was, how much charge passes at this amount of time? Multiply point five. There you go. If I multiply by my delta T, I'll get how much charge. <laughs> so you do the math here. What do we get? 20. 20 what? Coulombs. Volts. I think somebody said it. Coulombs of charge. Let me ask you another question. How many electrons pass through that wire in that amount of time? Ten. Mm -hmm. You know how to get the answer. How many was it? How many electrons pass this point? Whatever that point is. How many electrons oh, pass coulombs. through that point? One. Twenty coulombs of charge went by. How many electrons? <laughs> it will take a calculator to get the answer. No, nope, but you know enough information to figure it out. We can do this a little more correctly because there are two significant figures. Each electron is worth, an electron is worth negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. 
So why don't you on your calculators take that 20 and divide it by, I don't care about the negative, we're counting, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. How many electrons went past that spot? 1.25 times 10 to the negative 18. A lot right there. 1.25 times 10 to the 18? Negative. No. 18, 18. Okay, 18, positive 18. Yeah. A negative. lot of <laughs> electrons. A lot, a lot. Resistors can be used to control the amount of current in a circuit. Look on page 600 in your book. You guys have seen circuit boards at some point. You have seen circuit boards probably. There's a picture on page 600. Every one of those little tube things with those colored stripes going around them, those are all resistors. So a resistor can simply control how much current goes to different parts of my circuit. So I need more current going down this path, then I put a smaller resistor. Less current, a bigger resistor on there. So we can control the amount of current that goes down different paths or circuits in it. Salt water and perspiration lower the body's resistance. Now, if you're struck by lightning, it will not matter whether you have been sweating and have salt water on your body or not. That's a high enough potential difference that electricity will pass right through you. But you have heard of these things called lie detectors, right? Lie detectors work on a combination of things. One of the things they measure is your heart rate. Another thing they measure is the electrical resistance in your body. So when I start asking you those hard questions, how many hours did you study physics last night? And you start sweating under the lights, your body's resistance is going to change. So it's a combination of many things, these lie detectors, which are sometimes allowed, maybe in courts, and sometimes not, because they're not necessarily accurate, but you know, it looks good on the movies. So the salt water is gonna lower your body's resistance. Um, power line falls down. Now, let's say it falls down over your car, and you are in your car. You should not step out of your car. Because, especially if it was in a storm and there's water on the ground, it's probably going to carry some current through the ground. That power line is probably still alive or something like that. So just remember that your body made up largely of water, just like water on the ground will carry a current. You don't like to carry a current through your body very much. Um, approximately one amp of current across your heart can stop your heart. And 40 of them can definitely. Yes. Now, when you, let's say you get struck by lightning, there may be may, way more than one amp. So everybody that's struck by lightning does not die, by the way. Um, some people do, but don't always, because it's not necessarily going to go across your heart. It depends on the path that it takes. Electricity will always take the path of least resistance. It's sometimes hard to predict what that path is, but some other um, just little pieces of advice. Let's say you're working on a car. If you're working on a car, you never want to around a battery or anything that has electrical potential in it to have both hands touch opposite terminals. Because if it goes in one hand and out the other hand, well, guess what's in between those arms? The heart, right across the heart. Um, so some people talk about, stick your left hand in your back pocket if you're right-handed. And then you work like this. Even if you grab a hold of something that's live with your right hand, well, then maybe it will go down the right side of your body and through your right leg and get to the ground and it doesn't go across your heart. Another thing, your muscles work on electrical currents, so that's how they contract and release. So if you get an electrical charge in your body, your muscles will clamp up like that. So if you're wanting to see if something has a little charge in it, well, you shouldn't be flailing your hands around, but hit it with the back side of your hand, so that if your hand goes like that, you didn't just clamp down on it. You go like this, and now you're stuck. My dad did that once. Living overseas in Indonesia, he was um, the president of a college there, 
and the campus had this main road that went through it, and one side of campus went dark. The other side of campus had power. Well, there was a power line that went over, and then it dropped under the ground, went under the road, and came up, back up on the poles. Well, that's a very likely spot that the problem was. So my dad, not thinking real well, but gets a ladder, sticks it under that pole, climbs up, grabs that wire. Nothing. I mean, he shouldn't have grabbed the wire, but he grabbed the wire. Nothing. So he shakes the wire, and contact was made somewhere. His hand is now frozen on that wire because his muscles have cramped up. Thankfully, he thought very quickly, or his angels pushed him. He stepped off the ladder, and he dropped, and when he fell, it ripped his hand off that wire, and he was fine. <laughs> But be careful when you're around electricity. Is it a six-foot ladder or like a 12-foot ladder? I don't know how tall it was. Not to, he didn't break anything, so it must not have been too tall. And thankfully, he didn't electrocute himself. Potentiometers have variable resistance. You know, when you go into a room and maybe there's kind of two popular ones. You have this light switch that has a little circle and you can push it and it goes on and off and then you turn it and the lights get bright and dim. Some of them have a little just slider switch that's right there, get bright and dim. You know, you can set the moon for physics. <laughs> Those are potentiometers. It's a variable resistance. When you move it one way, the lights come bright, low resistance, current flowing easily. You move it another way, the lights get dim because it's high resistance. That's all that is going on there. And some potentiometers are literally as easy as if I have this coil of wire right here that's fairly high resistance. Well, if the wire comes in here and I have my knob and it's setting right next to where the electricity comes in, low resistance because I'm right here where the electricity is coming in. And as I move it this way, well, it has to travel down this wire of higher resistance. And the farther I put it, the longer the length is and the higher resistance it is and the dimmer it gets. Potentiometer. They can be fairly simple mechanical devices like that. 601, number 6. And Oh, there's a picture on 602 right there of a potentiometer that kind of works that way. It's a dial that you can just turn. Number 6, 601. Current in a certain resistor is 0 0.50 amps. So we know that is I. And we have a potential difference of 110 volts. What comes out of the wall right down here? How many volts? Do you know? It's in 110 to 120 range, somewhere in there, depending on what it is. Should have brought my voltmeter in today. We'll do that later when we're talking about. This is AC. AC means Alternating current. alternating current. DC is direct current. So your batteries, your smartphones, all those things are charged and run off direct current. Even if you plug it in the wall, it has a transformer. It's going to change it. It's going to reduce the voltage. It's going to change it to direct current. Um, so the battery, 9-volt battery, I mean, if you want to, you can stick it on your tongue and, tongue and it will tingle. It's not going to hurt you. I mean, it will hurt a little bit on your tongue, but it's not really going to hurt you. But you don't want to stick your tongue in the voltage over there. Pretty limited source of that stuff right there. A little nine volt battery, you're probably okay. See, you get lots of good advice at business class. Uh, hey, what is the operating? What is the current in the same resistor if the operating potential difference drops down to 90 volts? Okay, so we need to first figure out what is the resistance in this circuit. So what formula are we going to use? I equals A equals change in V over I. Oh, oh. Over. So I was going to do R. <laughs> You're right. I jumped ahead a little bit. R equals potential difference divided by current. Then if I solve for by I, multiply by I, divide by R, we get this thing right over here. Delta V over R. Now, this formula right here, which we talk about being Ohm's law, wherever it was back here. Oh, it doesn't even say Ohm's law. All right. This formula right over here, how I you can memorize it this way. This is the one that we're going to use over and over again all the time when we're talking about current electricity flowing. And I happen to memorize it this way. So however you want to, you can just rearrange that one. Um, 
but you'll want to have that thing memorized. We use it quite a bit. It's a very simple formula. So what do we have here? We had 110 volts, and we're going to divide it by our res in just a minute. Yeah, you had that. <laughs> I had it right the first time. We have 110 volts, and we're going to divide it by our current to 0.5 amps. We don't need a calculator. It's going to be a 55. Divide by one half is multiplying oh, by oh. two. 220 what? What is resistance measure? Ohms. 220 ohms. So there we go. That is what our circuit has in it. Now part A, they say, all right, what's going to happen to the current when I have a potential difference of 90 volts on it? So now we don't know the current. We have the resistance of a 220 ohm circuit here. And we are going to have a potential difference of 90 volts on it. I want you to, before you do any calculations, think conceptually of what is going to happen to the current. It's going to go down. Yeah. Think of your voltage as the push, how strong the electricity is being pushed. And the resistance is how high it's fighting against that push. So if I drop my push down to 90 from 110, and the resistance stays the same, I'm going to have less flowing through it. Now, if we actually solve it, rearrange this one like I did a minute ago, and we'll do our math on it, and what do we get? 90 divided by 220, what's our current? Yeah, point four one. Point four Amps. The current that's flowing through there, easy enough. Part B. Operating potential difference now goes to 130 volts. So conceptually, what's going to happen? It's going to increase. Yeah, it's going to increase that current. So to run it through this nice thing over here, what do we do? We bump it up to 130 divided by our resistance. How many amps of current are coming through it? Yeah, 0.591. Uh, 0.59 amps of current. So within a year of building my house, um, one Sabbath morning, my wife and I were both in the bathroom getting ready for church, and the lights just seemed awfully bright. I was like, why are those lights so bright? What is going on? Well, thankfully, I have a multimeter at home, which can check for voltage. And so I checked the wall outlet. Now, we just <laughs> talked about coming out of the wall outlet should be about what? How many volts? Yes, in the 110, 120 range, something like that. <clears throat> I had 145 volts registering on my outlets. That's a little too much. I can burn out electrical components with that much energy force trying to push those things through. So I called up the power company, and they came and they checked the transformer that's sitting out there. You know those barrel things that you see sitting on poles? Those are transformers. We come in at higher voltage and step it down to 220, 110, 120, somewhere around in there. And that had gone bad, and it was letting too high a voltage into my house, which would have been really expensive if I hadn't noticed that the lights were too bright when we were getting ready one morning. So I was very thankful for that. So they would, that would have been... Your fault because you didn't tell them to do their job. 